everyone, please welcome writer director Jeff Rowe. Hey, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. So I wanted to start off, um, I mean, the big thing is we've seen many versions yep. of Ninja Turtles. <laughs> uh, we were bonding on our love of the 80s uh, animation and the toys beforehand. So, but, so can you tell us about you know, finding the right balance between past iterations and your own story? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, when when we set out to do this, uh, in, in conversations I had with uh, Seth and Evan, uh, we, we just kind of, we made a decision early on that we never wanted to stick too, too tightly to canon or what's been done before. Uh, our job, first and foremost, is to be filmmakers and to tell an engaging story, and, and ideally someone who loves the Ninja Turtles can sit down and enjoy the movie, and someone who's never even heard of them could go into a theater, sit down, and still still have a meaningful uh, uh, emotional experience. So uh, we just made a promise that any time something that's, that didn't make sense or is just the way things had, had been done historically in, uh, in, in Turtles, if, if it didn't make sense, we wouldn't do it, we wouldn't commit to it, and, and we gave ourselves freedom to change uh, the backstory. And it's scary, because this is a very meaningful property to a lot of people, and, and when I signed on to do it, I got a lot of tweets that were like, hey man, don't mess it up. Uh, and, uh, but I, th I think in the end, like fans, even ones who were like, hey, you changed that, but I get why, and, and people, people respected those choices. Also, I'm just realizing this is a beautiful theater. <laughs> I've never been in it before. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, that's a huge stamp of approval to have the, the fans say that. Yeah. I mean, watching it, you get the nostalgia. You remember all the other iterations, the ones you loved, maybe the ones you didn't love, but it's fresh. It feels new. Yeah. You know, speak about that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, we, we tried to we tried to craft a, a sense of nostalgia in ways that weren't just direct references to old Ninja Turtles things. Because uh, I'm not like a huge uh, comic books person. I don't know a ton about Marvel outside of the movies. And and whenever I would go to one of those movies and see a moment where like. A character walks on screen, and then like there's a dramatic pause, and like half the people in the audience cheer, and they're like, "Oh!" And I'm just like, "What's happening? What's going on? I don't, I don't know who this is, or or why I should care." Um, we tried to we tried to leave that stuff uh, out of the film, but but give it a '90s flavor through its cinematography, its color, the music choices, using a lot of uh, late '80s, early '90s hip hop to to create. Or, or to evoke the feeling of the 90s without it being uh, directly a period piece or yeah. taking place in the past. Well, there, there's a lot of those elements that we'll get to, but one I want to really jump into is the animation style. It's, it's, own, it's, it's, it's fresh style. Can you uh, talk to how you kind of came across, came to this look? Yeah, well, uh, one of our first big early decisions was to cast actual teenagers as as the Ninja Turtles, which mysteriously has never been done before. They're they're usually voiced by like grown men, uh, which as a child gave me like a very distorted view of what it meant to 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 be a teenager. Um, so that dictated a lot about the coverage, the cinematography, the dialogue style, and the way that they were gonna talk over each other and argue with each other. And then also, uh, when it came time to pick a unifying visual style, um, we, we decided to make it look like teenage drawings, like the, the kind that you do when you're 16 in the margins of your notebook when you're supposed to be in class. Uh, for, from that period in your life before you have any kind of formal art training, and uh, uh, there was a day when we had everyone on the art team bring in drawings that they made when they were teenagers, and uh, and we just looked at them, and and they're awful. They're terrible, terrible <laughs> drawings. But the the interesting thing is like when you sit down to make one of those, there's no part of you that thinks you're going to make a bad drawing. You're like, I am drawing the best 
monster truck that's ever been drawn in the, the history of humanity. I'm so good at drawing, and it's so wonky and weird, and it's this mix of passion and intention, but the lack of skill to actually pull it off. And it, and it felt like this kind of beautiful metaphor for the characters in the film who uh, have a lot of confidence, have a lot of big ideas and hopes and aspirations, but have not had to check that against the, the real world yet. In most animated films, you know, everything looks clean and smooth, and in this one, it's not. There's a grittiness to it. I mean, yeah. it's, there's, I mean you get the sketchy aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, can you? How no, do you totally. have animators go about that style? Yeah, I mean, because that, that, that's part of the teen style is like there's there's mistakes, and and I think that that's uh, uh, you know, 30 years of uh, Western CG studio animated films have got very homogenous and very clean and very perfect in the way that they look and and photorealistic, and it's like you can see pores on the faces of characters now, and, and, and no one stopped to ask, like, is that a good thing? Do we wanna, do we wanna see Shrek's pores? I don't know. Um, like, there's something so human about sketchy lines and things that are asymmetrical and, and misshapen, and uh, it, it was a way to preserve the feeling that this film was made by artists and that uh, it, to make it almost look like a work in progress, um, uh, kind of like the characters are, even though every one of those mistakes is like painstakingly crafted, because uh, you can't get a computer to make mistakes. You have to like force it and tell it to do things uh, bad. And and there's there. I mean, this is getting really technical, but like instead of photographic depth of field in the film. Um, the drawing just gets worse the further away from the camera it is, like as if the person who drew the frame got lazy and was like, I can't draw these buildings in the background. Uh, so that's how we lose information and create depth in the, in the frame, but it was just based on looking at these teenage drawings. Well, and that, that was what I was curious about. It's like you basically have to, I mean, I imagine any animated film go frame by frame, but with this it was like you were trying to go through to be like, how can we find the right balance of imperfection and yeah. perfection. Yeah, the, the the design, which is like the shapes of characters, line, character design, uh, buildings, uh, uh, like all of that, very sketchy, very teenage. The lighting and color, very realistic, very grounded, very live action influenced, looked at a lot of like Wong Kar Wai films and the street photography of Alex Webb and, and tried to be really, um, selective with colors and uh, y you know when you make a CG animated film computers have billions of colors in them things that the human eye can't even perceive or don't even exist outside of like a uh, uh, Apple retina monitor uh, and we tried to not use those uh, like we tried to be Every color in the film, every texture is is sampled like I dropped from. Uh, uh, a photograph or a scan of a, a, a real object, and uh, uh, we just tried to like use real physical colors the, the the way the eye sees. I really like that. Again, in most animated films, it's all high key lighting. Yeah. In this, the whole film is low key lighting, except for yeah. the post credit scene in the high school. Yeah. Can you speak about that? Yeah, it's. Uh, the, I think the studio is very nervous about it because I think with with a lot of with these kinds of films, typically they're in the daytime and they need to be colorful because that's that's what uh, that's what sells. That's what's what's marketable. But this was a story about characters who had to hide from the world and were afraid of the daylight and couldn't be seen in it and, and were so afraid of actually being seen as who they were. So, so it was so necessary to the story to keep them in shadows, keep it at night. And there's also just like, I have this uh, uh, romantic love of the look of New York in, in these 80s and 90s films and, and that gritty, dark rooftop kind of kind of vibe that uh, it was a joy to capture. And you use all motivated lighting throughout the whole movie. It's yes. very noir feeling. Yeah, everything's like, that That was one of the rules that we gave ourselves is like every light and color has to be motivated by 
a light source that you can see in frame or see in the establishing shot so you know like, oh, they're red because they're next to a giant neon sign, not just because we're being inventive with the color. Yeah. And so we've seen, um, you know, reboots and stuff where it's like, do we include the origin story or not? And you do include an origin story, but it's unlike an origin story we've ever seen. There's a lot more, you know, emotion and heart in yeah. this. It's it's like the so so traditionally it's like uh, the Ninja Turtle. There's ooze, and then uh, if you're an animal and you touch the ooze, you become a, a human animal. But sometimes, also in the past, it's been you're a human who touches the ooze, and then you become whatever the last animal was you came in contact with. And none of that made any sense. And we also realized like trying to make too much sense of that is just going to be boring to, to, to an audience. Like there, there's a little bit of buy-in, there's a little bit of just sense logic from, from, from the property and, and its tone that, that uh, we just kind of tried to get through that stuff and focus on the emotional part, which is uh, this is a single dad, a, a adoptive dad, which, which is uh, not dissimilar from my own childhood. Uh, and, and it's like, this guy who did not plan to be a father now has four kids and is trying to raise them as, as best as he can, but you know doesn't really know how to do that and wasn't maybe equipped for it in, in the first place. Might have bit off more than, than he can chew. Um, but he loves them, but he's also flawed and has, has a hard time not projecting his own limitations onto, onto his kids. And that, that just felt like a rich, relatable, uh, story and a, and a good thing to dig into. I think that was the thing that surprised me the most um, was that this is a different splinter than we have yeah. ever seen before. And the trauma that he has yeah. is so fascinating. Yeah, it's, it, it's like, I don't know, Splinter's always been this like wise kind of stoic sensei, which I'm sure some people have that as a parent, but I, I did not like... Uh, 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 it was. It felt important to make him more emotional and more nervous and more controlling, and uh, and it, it comes from a very realistic place. But you know, his his arc is realizing that his trauma is his own, and uh, his children might not experience that, and he he doesn't help them by uh, continuing that cycle and and putting that onto them. Getting Jackie Chan to play Splinter. Yeah, it's uh, uh, unbelievable. I still don't know how it happened. I, I don't know why he said uh, yes, uh, but he's so wonderful and and warm and it, it, like it, it, it makes sense from like oh yeah he's like the he's a martial arts master and he's so funny about it too. Like of course Jackie Chan would would, would be great for this, but something I love about Jackie Chan is he's just so. Uh, warm and lovable and and he's not even when he's like fighting people in movies it's not like whoa look at how cool he is it's like he's kind of goofy and he's kind of he makes mistakes and he's not perfect and and there's just this like foundation of humanity to him that uh, felt like such a good dimension to to give the character and uh, we we rec would record him from Beijing uh, over Zoom, which would be like 6 a.m. for us, uh, so we'd all be very tired. Um, and then we would leave those record sessions just like jumping up and down, like, can you believe how funny it is? That was amazing. Oh, it's Jackie Chan. What? He uh, and, and he was so hardworking, and, and there would be times where we're like, Great, you did it, and he's like, "No, I want to do it again." Uh, like he's he's a perfectionist, and and all the things that you would hope to be true about him are, and uh, that that was a that was a great joy. Well, and I read, I believe, some of his fighting sequence or multiple. You, you looked at old Jackie Chan yeah, films. Yeah, yeah, that that we kind of use that to like. You see it in the Chop Shop. You see it in the fight sequence with Splinter at TCRI. Like it's very. Um, there's a every frame of painting video on YouTube that really breaks down the Jackie Chan fighting style and, and some key elements of it that 
that we looked at, and then we went and watched Police Story and Rumble in the Bronx and Legend of Drunken Master and, and just kind of like analyzed his films and tried to have the rhythm and pacing of uh, those fight sequences. Because uh, I think no one's done action comedy better than him. It's, it's really great. Now, The Mutant Gang. It's yes. just, I can just tell you guys <laughs> had a lot of fun there. Yeah. We, uh, it, it, it started, there weren't originally going to be a bunch of mutants in the film, but we have this amazing character designer, Woodrow White, uh, who, 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 his art style is a huge influence on the way the final film looks. Uh, but he did these drawings of Bebop and Rocksteady, because we were going to have Bebop and Rocksteady, and I was like, whoa, these are so cool. I love the way they, they, they look. Can you try these other toys that I liked as a, a child just because I think I wanted fan art of them? But he would do these drawings of mutants, and we're like, wow, that's so cool. Whoa, look, oh, it's Mondo Gecko. Oh, man, that's, that's great. I guess we have to write these characters into the movie now. Uh, so then we, we just would add more and more mutants, mainly because we liked the designs and, and kind of how unhinged they were. And, and uh, for animation, like, they're, they're really pushed cool looking designs, some of which are very complicated and difficult to animate. And then we would put like eight of these characters in a shot together, like the bar of difficulty, technical difficulty just kept going up and up and up. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun with that. And, and that was another way to kind of like capture a little bit of that feeling of, of like me being a four year old, buying a Ninja Turtles toy, looking at the back of the box and being like, whoa, wingnut, leatherhead? I have to collect all of these and I wanna make up stories for each of these characters and um, yeah. Well, you, you brought each of them to life. I mean, I want a whole movie just for, with Mondo. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, you know, Paul Rudd uh, uh, is uh, delightful and uh, uh, I think he's going places. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it was a, it was an interesting assignment because it, you have a couple lines per character and it's like, how can we make these really nutrient dense? Like, how can you get a lot of character out of like three lines and like 23 words total? Uh, and, uh, some of them have more screen time, like, like Mondo, um, but it was it was fun crafting bits and and also kind of just looking at drawings of mutants and being like okay, what's a good actor to to post Malone as a singing a manta ray? Great, he, he let's just do sings it. his name. That's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. We post can do that. That's <laughs> the, uh, get him in, get him in the booth. What I also like though is the villain you create yourself. He's not in canon at all. No, Super no. Fun. Uh, the movie was going to be about Shredder for, for, for the longest time, and then it, it, it wasn't working. He was too big of a villain. It took up too much of the story. And, and because we were focusing on this story of acceptance and, and trying to feel like you belong in the world, uh, from a storytelling perspective, it just felt like it would be good to have a villain that mirrored some of that, that, that had a similar past to the Turtles and was on a similar journey, even if they were approaching it from a, from a different way. It's very like uh, Magneto, Dr. X, like they're the same, but they both want, what they want is like crazy different and, and, that, and that's where the conflict comes from. And um, we, uh, so we found this, we, when I say found, I mean we created, uh, we stumbled on the idea of this character, Superfly, and, um, uh, it just kind of made a lot of things click into place. And then, like, making the mutants his kind of surrogate family, put him in this paternal role that mirrored splinters and also helped them arc each other or not arc in the, the case of Superfly. Um, and it just kind of, like, everything started clicking. I think audiences, uh, we appreciate when villains are three-dimensional. And yeah. he was. I mean, everything you're talking about. And getting Ice Cube, who has never done voice acting before. He's so funny. He's so, like, 
uh, m most of what he said we couldn't use in the film. But uh, <laughs> there's there's a very funny uh, uh, different cut of this film somewhere. Uh, but uh, like he, he was so he's so funny, but he's also legitimately scary. Like when he's serious, when he's when he's demanding, when he puts his foot down, like it's it's believable. It, it, it feels credible. And uh, uh, he just brought so much to the, to the role. And um, yeah. <laughs> and the th you, you touched on, you know, big themes of the movie is acceptance and wanting to be liked. Um, can you talk about, you know, the source of having that be the central driving force of all the characters in this movie? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, it wasn't initially what we set out to do, but it's kind of very, very early on. We had the idea for that scene of like them watching humans watch a movie, and it's like something like this that is just a normal part of our lives that we totally take for granted. It's one of the favorite, one of my favorite parts of my life, um, and them just being unable to 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 do that and wanting to feel uh, uh, closer to it and. Uh, I, I guess like, I guess it's it's both. A, it's like a universal want, but it's also there's something so specifically um, teenage about it. Like at some point in your teen years, you hit puberty. Your body starts changing. Your brain starts thinking really fast. You become very self-aware of everyone around you and and what everyone is looking at and and thinking. And it's like you kind of just wanna fit in or you want to find your people and um and belong and and making the movie about acceptance felt both universal but also like exactly the journey these teenage characters needed to go on and one of i think the most powerful lines for me was when april says she's doing this for the wrong reasons yeah so can you speak to about that line and its importance yeah, it's it's she she kind of she kind of figures it out a little bit sooner than than they do, um, but it's like you know I think I think when you're what, what like talking about that time uh, uh, of of puberty and going to high school and all of a sudden there's so many other kids around you there's there's like a period in your life where it's like I will do anything to be liked like what <laughs> just just name it like uh, and I think the turtles are a little bit on that journey but but the 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 arc is is like you don't want to be liked for that like like the the emotionally mature thing is to to kind of figure out who you are and and figure out what you like about yourself and then find and surround yourself with people who affirm that for for you and um uh yeah it's a april kind of gets there there a little bit sooner um but is able to help the turtles realize that for themselves so in every past version, it's always been called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but as you touched on earlier, they never really felt like teenagers yep, yep. until now. Yes. So, and you even cast the four voice actors are teenagers. Yes. Can you speak to the, I mean, the chemistry they have yeah. Like on uh, initially, we started recording them uh, individually. We, we were just recording them one by one. And, and they're good actors, so it was fine. It was funny. But there was something missing. And, and Seth had uh, recently done uh, the live action or not live action, depending on how you count it, Lion King uh, with um, uh, he would do these record sessions with uh, Donald Glover and Billy Eichner, all three in the booth at the same time. And it, he was like, it was so fun. It was so much better than any of these other voice acting things I did where, where I was on my own. Um, uh, we have to try that on this film. And everyone was like, we can't do it. It's a sound nightmare. Like, they'll just talk over each other. Like, uh, and we're like, oh, we don't care. Whatever. We'll burn a record. Let's just try it and see how that feels. And then we got them all in the booth, and it was it, it, it was electric. Just we we kept the tape rolling. We would record them just talking about their day or their lives to each other, showing each other YouTube videos, riffing on that things that they weren't even being the Ninja Turtles. They were just being themselves. Uh, and then we we very immediately realized one. Uh, we have to completely throw out the script, uh, and and uh, two, we have to uh, kind of write it with them and just give them room to to improv. So we'd go in with an idea of like, here's what the scene is, but how would you say this? And then someone would say something funny, like. Uh, 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 
they were talking, uh, uh, Micah Abbey, who plays Donatello, was like, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna go get these gangsters. And then he started impersonating uh, a New Yorker with a really bad New Yorker impersonation, and it was funny, and Seth was like, that's great. Everybody, do an impersonation of what you think a New Yorker sounds like. And then for two minutes, they just talked about bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches. And then we just took that and put that in the film and, and animated it in this really technically difficult uh, uh, one shot. Uh, but uh, yeah, that became the recording process and it became about capturing these like just very human real moments instead of trying to script something that is what me and Seth think a modern 16 year old sounds like. I mean, it definitely translates to the final product. So yeah. I, I, I want to talk about the production design. There's like so much in there's the background and yeah. everything. Can you speak to building the world? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's it, a lot of credit goes to our, our incredible art team, Yashar Kasai, Arthur Fong, Tiffany Lamb, and, and all of the VizDev artists who, who touched it. Um, uh, we we wanted it. We wanted New York to feel real. We didn't want it to be fantastical. We wanted to to really ground the film in an observed reality. Because even though it's about mutant turtle men, the idea is that if it feels like our real world and and reminds you of real life, that when it becomes even more fantastical and there's a giant whale monster destroying the city all of that, you'll be emotionally hooked and invested in it because you, you've bought into the, the reality of, of the world. So uh, it was a lot, we started this film during COVID, so um, it was looking at Google Maps a lot, images of New York, whatever we could find, watching films and, and just trying to capture the spirit and feeling uh, 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 of a place. Yeah. Speaking of the well monster, it's a very Cronenberg monster. Yeah, How yeah, did yeah. you come up with that? I, I said more Cronenberg a lot. That was <laughs> that was a very popular note that I gave <laughs> on the on the film. Uh, it was. Um, it's from an old idea in the script where they get a bunch of ooze and it just, uh, uh, the villain is, uh, the old villain was kind of an idiot and didn't know what to do with it. And he's just like, ah, oh, just give me a bunch of animals. I'll throw a bunch of ooze on it and let's see what happens. And then uh, it turns into it like a giant Katamari style uh, monster. Uh, and we had uh, Woodrow White, our, our character designer. I was like, just do a drawing of like a giant monster made up of uh, hundreds of animals. Make it look like it would be impossible to animate or build. Uh, and then he did that. And then when he did that drawing, and it was so like awkward and, and misshapen, we're like, oh man, this is beautiful. We have to use this. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we put it in the film, and we started building it. And then at some point, we realized, uh, initially, Superfly created this monster and then unleashed it on New York. And we're like, that doesn't make sense. Wouldn't it just be better if it was Superfly and Ice Cube's voice came out of this thing's mouth? Uh, so we added fly eyes <laughs> onto it and wings. And, and thankfully, due to our style and, and the tone of the film, like usually the dumber the choices, the funnier they, they became. So just like plopping fly eyes on this giant monster somehow made it funnier and 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 more appealing and uh, we we just kind of like embraced a lot of like first takes and 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 rough ideas and uh, and then when that monster forms uh, all of Ice Cube's dialogue is just based on me showing him the design and be like okay you just transformed into this describe your body and he just improved like I've got horse feet what's going on here. Uh, and it's that, that was one of my favorite record sessions. So is there a list somewhere of all the pop culture references in this movie? No. <laughs> I mean, there, I'm sure I'm sure someone's made it. I'm sure our script coordinator made it. Uh, there were ones things we had to keep track of, like Ice Cube would just keep throwing song lyrics into his improv, and then we'd have to go legally clear a song and pay a bunch of money. Uh, he was Ice Cube was just like racking up a giant bill every time he recorded. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's 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 a lot in there, and there would be stuff too that like. Both, both pop culture references and just slang terms that like the kids would use that we'd be like, that's great, that sounds funny. Google that, like make sure that's not, like we can say that, that's not messed up. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we tried to be 
be pretty free with it. Yeah. As you talked on a lot of these needle drops you have, but I want to talk about, you had Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross do the score. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, those guys. Uh, yeah, it, it's I, I love the score to this film so much. It's 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 I love the music and the needle drop, but the score is also this like beautiful companion to it. They they did a very uh, beat driven rhythmic score that uh, is both very different and distinct from the needle drop, but also sits perfectly uh, uh, alongside it. And um, uh, apparent like. We were looking for composers. Seth and I were like, man, Trent and Atticus are, are great. They're like the best composers. They'd never say yes to this. So I don't know, cross them off the list. And Seth was like, in my professional experience, get the no. Just like always get the no and don't don't wonder. So we, we went out to them and uh, apparently they were fans of Mitchell's versus the Machines and uh, they agreed to take a meeting and then we went to their studio, Seth and I, and like, went into a fugue state and just pitched the movie for 30 minutes and uh, and they're like cool cool like let's see a script and I was like great we'll send it we'll send that right over Seth we have to rewrite the script we have to we have to make this better and and worthy of our uh, our our music heroes um, and then we rewrote it and and sent it to them and uh, uh, they they signed on and uh, and I think they they liked the vision and I think they liked the opportunity to do a different kind of score than they than they normally do, uh, and the only real creative direction we gave was um, we're like it would be cool if it sounds like it was made by teenagers, like a garage band, uh, and they're like, yeah, we were thinking the same thing. We'll try that, and and you really hear it in like the music in the Chop Shop. It's this very like Devo garage rock like uh, kind of rough sounding uh, uh, amazing piece of music. Uh, last question I got for you is, um, I mean, you have a great filmography, Gravity Falls, Disenchantment, Mitchells versus Machines. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but then you're now working with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, who also have a great resume. Yes. Can you tell us about that, uh, forming that partnership on this? Uh, it, it was, it's, it's been really nice. Like, I really love working with those guys because I think, uh, it, it's a chicken or the egg thing. Like I grew up watching their movies and really responding to the comedy of it. And it's like, do I respond to the comedy of this because I feel like it's made by a kindred spirit, or is this comedy shaping me and I'm now becoming a kindred spirit with these with these people? Um, but like we we both like uh, uh, the three of us like care about it being character forward, care about it making sense and, and people not just making decisions that no character would ever make in real life. Uh, care about things feeling authentic and naturalistic, care about uh, realistic, improv comedy performances, moments of finding humor instead of these like perfectly crafted uh, set up punchline jokes. Um, so, so it was just like a good taste match and, and they are restlessly creative best idea wins, don't care where the idea comes from, just like whatever, we all win if we make a good movie and, and they're very open and collaborative and just just wanted it to be good. So it, it was nice to, it's nice to have producers who are as invested as you are and care as much about making it good as you do and then also have the same taste as you so there's no creative conflict. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Amazing. Who here is um, hoping to see a sequel soon? Yeah? Okay. Well, hopefully we'll have you back with a sequel yeah. soon. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.